Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Niranjan Sarkar and I'm Deputy Director of the LSE South Asia Centre. I am delighted to welcome all of you this afternoon to the last event in our series, um, Geopolitics uh, Beyond Borders, for this term. Uh, it's a series that we do with LSE Ideas, which is LSE's foremost foreign policy think tank. And um, we this event, uh, this afternoon, uh, is going to focus on Quad AUKUS and the rise of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I will speak a bit more about this event uh, later on before I introduce the speakers, uh, because of course, in light of the war in Ukraine, this the, the whole conversation and the debate has taken on a completely new, new and very, very um, exciting and interesting uh, turn. Before that, a very big and a very warm welcome to our audiences who have joined us from across the globe. Uh, they are from various time zones, so I know they are uh, at different times of the day. So thank you very much for joining. I can see people typing in in our message, good morning or good afternoon. So thank you very much. Uh, our audiences have shown an enormous amount of interest in this event. And uh, so I'm especially glad that we're finally able to, to, to bring this underway. The event is actually being held via Zoom. So all of you are actually watching it uh, on YouTube. And you will notice that the chat function in YouTube has been enabled for all of you to ask questions. Uh, you're very warmly invited and you're very welcome to ask questions to panelists. You can pose a question to an individual speaker. You can pose a question to the entire panel. And I will pose those questions after um, all our speakers have made their initial uh, remarks and comments. If you would like to pose a question to a particular speaker, then do, please do mention uh, them uh, by, by name. Um, if you would like to tweet, then please do tag us at SAsiaLSC. And for individual speakers, you will see that for those who do have Twitter handles, their Twitter handles appear in the details on the YouTube page. One last thing I should add is that had this event been happening on site at LSC, then members of the audience at LSC have the right to ask questions without revealing their identities. In keeping with that spirit, when I pose questions, I will ask only your question and not mention your name, even though I know that your name is visible on, on the YouTube chat box, but at least we'll stay close to the spirit. Before I introduce uh, the speakers, I just want to make some very brief comments about the event, how the event was initially conceived and what, uh, how it has changed dramatically in the last uh, four and a half, five weeks since, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, when we first uh, thought of this event, and I discussed it with Christopher, um, it was to draw attention to the Quad and AUKUS alliances that have come up in recent times and uh, the rise of the Indo-Pacific as a region of geopolitical and geostrategic importance and how uh, the West with a capital W was reaching out to uh, the Indo-Pacific region uh, for various geopolitical uh, interests of, of their own, as well as catering to concerns of the region at that time. Four and a half weeks ago, when Russia invaded Ukraine, this has taken on a completely different uh, and more interesting and more dynamic for an academic discussion turn. It has come principally from India's position uh, in, uh, in terms of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and that how it is at variance, India's position is at variance with almost all the other members of the Quad and AUKUS Alliance countries. Today is a particularly interesting day and I'm sure uh, Professor Harsh Pant will mention it, but today is a day when the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov the British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, as well as the Deputy Special Envoy and Chief Strategist for Sanctions of the United States Government, Dalip Singh, are all in Delhi today, Thursday, the 31st of March, to have conversations. India's position vis-a-vis -vis Russia in the context of Ukraine uh, has caused a lot of concern. EU's uh, Special Envoy for Indo-Pacific, Gabriel Desantin, uh, said he was not pleased 
uh, US President Biden has said in his position is shaky. And of course, uh, Liz Truss, who has gone from the United Kingdom, has gone uh, for a series of reasons, including very importantly, the free trade agreement, uh, which has been under discussion uh, for a long time between the United Kingdom and India. So how the other countries of these alliances are going to engage with India over the Russia-Ukraine question alongside the interests of the original Quad AUKUS alliances, uh, the position of Japan, the position of Australia, and of course, the increasing closeness between Russia and China, given that China is another country of enormous interest to the Quad AUKUS alliance. So there's a lot uh, that's going on. There's a lot that's going on today. There's a lot that's been going on. So I'm hoping uh, and expecting that it, it's going to be a great discussion. We've had a brief chat just before the event began to decide the order of speakers. And it is now my very pleasant duty to introduce the speakers. Uh, the order in which I'm going to introduce them is the order in which we've agreed they will speak. They will speak from of, about different aspects that uh, concern both Quad and AUKUS. And our first speaker will be Peter Watkins, who is visiting senior fellow at LSE Ideas and was formerly Director General Strategy and International 2017-2018 and Director General Security Policy 2014 to 2017, the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom. Yuka Koshino is Research Fellow for Security and Technology at the International Institute for Security Studies, better known as IISS in London, and an expert on Japanese security, economic security, and technology policy. Christopher Coker, uh, who is, uh, is co-director of LSE Ideas, and as I mentioned, the series is in collaboration with LSE Ideas, is an expert on US security issues, and the author most recently recently of Why War, which was published in 2021. Christopher is also a member of the Senior Advisory Board of the LSE South Asia Center. We are going to be joined shortly by Frederick Greer, who is Senior Policy Fellow of the Asia Program at the European Council of, on Foreign Relations with expertise in security issues concerning South Asia, the Indo-Pacific and related issues. If Frederick is able to join in time, then uh, we have agreed that Fred Frederick will speak before Christopher speaks. Finally, Harsh Pant is Professor of International Relations at the King's India Institute, King's College London, and Director, Studies and Head, Strategic Studies Program at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm now going to invite Peter to speak first, and just to reiterate to members of the audience, that please feel free to ask questions to the chat function. You can hear all the speakers then ask questions. You can ask questions as speakers are speaking. Peter, please speak now. You have about eight minutes. So after years of doing this, I still forgot to unmute myself. Um, anyway, thank you. And I'm going to look at the broader Indo-Pacific and the evolving role there of the European powers, including the UK. I'll give a British perspective. I say A, not B, because um, I am no longer an official and I now have a number of other affiliations. And obviously I speak in a strictly personal capacity. <clears throat> I'm not gonna to say too much about the Quad per se, uh, because the UK is not a member, not yet anyway. Um, so the current British government published its integrated review of security, defense, and foreign policy just over a year ago in March, 2021. This stated that the Euro-Atlantic region will remain acute to the UK's, will remain critical to the UK's security and prosperity, and saw Russia as the most acute threat to the UK. But it also included in the category of quote, significant changes and shifts in policy, unquote, a tilt to the Indo-Pacific tilt being the key word there. This was less pronounced than many commentators had expected and some had feared. And while commentators have tended to focus on the security dimension of this tilt, the text itself indicated that it would be more diplomatic and economic than military. At that point, there was no inkling, at least in public, of the AUKUS agreement announced six months later in mid-September 2021. 
So I'll provide a brief historical perspective and then comment on future options for the UK in the Indo-Pacific and also perhaps for other European powers. So when I was in the roles that um, Nilajan mentioned, I was part of a rolling discussion on the UK's uh, role in the Indo-Pacific. Much of it was framed around China, as I'll touch on later, but much of it was also about resources, diplomatic and military. Could the UK or a country like the UK make a difference or a meaningfully distinctive contribution to the security of the region? And this discussion used to peak annually just ahead of the Shangri-La dialogue. So in parallel, UK policy on the Indo-Pacific went from a focus on China as an engine of economic opportunity to a broader, quote, all of Asia, unquote, policy, to a more rounded view of China as both an economic and security actor. These phases were not strictly sequential. They overlapped to some degree, and they reflected an increasingly difficult balancing act in policy terms. The UK needs a thriving Indo-Pacific and a thriving China economically, but it couldn't and it can't ignore increasingly egregious Chinese behavior, whether in the East and South China Seas, Hong Kong, or around Taiwan. In my personal view, the integrated review contained more continuity than change. It moved us further along this tightrope walk on China. While its general approach is balanced, realistic, even hard-headed, it did, all, it did not fully answer the question about making a meaningful difference or contribution. And I think that same question applies to France, Germany, and the EU too. So against that background, how is the UK's tilt to the Indo-Pacific manifesting itself now, and what further options are open to the UK? So on the economic front, the UK has applied to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, and the British government hopes to complete the membership negotiations by the end of the year. On the military front, last year's carrier to task group deployment demonstrated both the UK's capability and its rich network of allies, partners, and friends in the region. Few countries operate aircraft carriers and fewer still with fifth generation combat aircraft. But such deployments will not take place every year or even as far as I'm aware on a regular pattern. And so do not make a continuing contribution to regional security. In the meantime, the UK government has deployed two modern offshore patrol vessels uh, to, the, to the region. But although a good example of the new doctrine of quote, persistent engagement set out in the integrated review and related documents, these vessels are comparatively small and thus unlikely to make a significant difference to the overall correlation of forces in the region. My view has been and remains that the UK and similar countries, European countries, can make a more significant and sustainable contribution to regional security in the Indo-Pacific through deepening their security and defense partnerships with allies and partners inside the region. And this has been happening quietly for some years. And in the case of the UK, specifically with Australia, India, and Japan. But there is scope to go further, not least through practical cooperation on capabilities. So there have been agreements with Japan over recent months on cooperation on engine and sensor technologies for future combat aircraft. And these could conceivably lead in time to collaboration on a future program. But the big move is, of course, the AUKUS agreement, as mentioned in the title. I've argued before that while there would inevitably be some competition between the European powers for defense business opportunities in the Indo-Pacific, there would be more than enough to go round and thus scope the complementarity too. Australia was where I had in mind, with France as the industrial partner for the new submarine program and the UK for the new frigate program. Well, obviously, AUKUS upended that, at least in the case of the new submarine program, and rather tests my thesis. But I don't think it necessarily completely invalidates it. The key point is that the countries of the Indo-Pacific will make their own sovereign decisions about the capabilities they require. In this case, the Australian government had become increasingly concerned about the problems with the submarine program and signaled publicly that it was looking at a plan B. And the deterioration in bilateral relations with China will have also raised doubts about whether the planned capability, which were conventional submarines, was still appropriate. 
and made it thinkable to change course and invest in the infrastructure for nuclear submarines. And that would have been unthinkable before. For the US and the UK, this situation presented strategic opportunities. The Biden administration had announced that, quote, America is back and wanted to nurture the US's alliances, but its handling of the withdrawal from Afghanistan left allies feeling bruised. The AUKUS agreement can therefore be seen as a very clear long-term US commitment to a close ally in a way consistent, importantly, with the US's own strategic calculus for the Indo-Pacific. And again, importantly, it was welcomed by the US's other allies in the region, uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, whatever certain countries said in Europe. For the UK government, AUKUS provided some substance to the concept of, quote, global Britain which had encountered considerable skepticism from academic and other commentators and showed that the UK could be a strategic actor in the Indo-Pacific. But AUKUS will be a significant challenge for the UK. Helping Australia develop its own nuclear infrastructure will be a major new demand on the UK's nuclear submarine industry, which is already under pressure to deliver the UK's own successor ballistic missile submarine program. My personal view is the UK government should face up to this challenge and actually embrace it, not try to insist that involvement in the Australian program will be at no detriment to the UK one or require no additional resources. I'm happy to expand on that in question. Finally, we must bear in mind that the Western country with the most equities at stake in the Indo-Pacific will remain the US. This is moving towards a more explicit deter deterrence posture towards China and will provide most of the forces required. And that is set out in more detail in the paperwork for the uh, Pacific Deterrence Posture, Pacific Deterrence Initiative. In my view, the UK and other countries should start by considering how they can best contribute to that deterrence posture, taking into account the views of the US and key regional partners, such as India, Japan, and Australia. And I think the same argument applies not only to the UK, but also to France and Germany. Although, as we may hear from Frederick, they would be less comfortable than the UK in explicitly following a, U a US lead. The reality is that while the UK is a big player militarily in the, in the Euro-Atlantic region, it is much less so in the Indo-Pacific. In terms of simple quantity or mass, its armed forces are actually smaller than Japan's. So while the UK and other European powers have a big and legitimate interest in the Indo-Pacific, to make a sustainable contribution to the security of the region, they might better help alleviate, it might be better for them to help alleviate the pressures on the US by carrying more of the burden in Europe and the Gulf, facilitating the refocusing of more US forces to the Indo-Pacific. You mentioned at the outset, how Russia's invasion of Ukraine has changed our approach. Um, I think it has actually reinforced the case for the sort of approach I am setting out. This is not a crude division of labor, as some uh, uh, US uh, academics have argued for, but a more balanced response to an increasingly assertive China in the Indo-Pacific and an increasingly assertive Russia in the Euro-Atlantic. And that's all I've got to say for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that was really brilliant as, as, as an opener for the discussion this afternoon. And um, I, I, I think at some point we will have to come back to, to what you just suggested, which is that um, uh, it will be very interesting to see how, in light of the details that you've mentioned, how um, the UK uh, reaches out to uh, and, and, and uh, negotiates with, with India in, the, in this matter. But um, our next speaker is uh, Yuka Koshino. Yuka is Research Fellow for Security and Technology at the International Institute for Security Studies, that's IISS, here in London, and an expert on Japanese security, economic security, and technology policy. Um, Yuka, uh, you have about eight minutes. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and thank you very much for having me with this uh, distinguished experts um, in this group. Actually really interested in what other speakers will say. But today, because the theme is around quad AUKUS ambitions and in South Asia or in the Indo-Pacific, I would like to make three points on how Japan sees, why Japan sees India as a key strategic partner, 
how that might change after India's responses towards the crisis going on in Ukraine. And then lastly, a, a little bit of um, how what it means, um, what AUKUS means for Quad as well from a Japan perspective. Um, these are all my personal views, as, um, um, so I'll just make that point in the beginning. So for point one, um, for Japan, India has become and will continue to be a key strategic partner for Japan to achieve both its geoeconomic and security goals as the largest democratic country in the world. So very briefly, um, from a very basic point of view, from J for Japan, from an economic standpoint, there is a synergy a lot of synergies between India and Japan. For instance, very broadly, Japan's demography is shrinking and aging, while India's younger generation or younger population is growing. And India is looking for technology partners to, to uh, modernize its, its, its economy um, in manufacturing and in, in the digital realms. And Japan um, could offer them, but while Japan struggles in its shrinking workforce and, and also in, even in Japan, when Japan is considered as a high-tech high country, it's also struggling, for instance, to build its own software engineers or high skilled laborers in the digital areas that is going to be the, driving the future economy. So these kind of synergies uh, makes a very natural economic partner for Japan. And Japan also, um, from a security standpoint, the two countries share the interest of maintaining the real space order in the region and freedom of navigation in the maritime space as maritime countries. And also that interest increasingly um, is challenged right now by China's um, maritime assertiveness and revisionist approaches to pursue its maritime claims. So against this backdrop, former Prime Minister Abe, um, already back in early 2000s in 2007, made this very famous confluences of the two sea speech in front of the Indian parliament. And, and for the first time linked up the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and, and introduced this concept of Indo-Pacific as a strategic kind of area. And this also led to the um, also kind of um, added momentum to development of the quadrilateral security dialogue um, that is becoming a very key in institu uh, institution in the center of today's discussion right now. Um, but it was also very much security focused um, arrangement at that point. And Prime Minister Abe back then also kind of described the four maritime uh, democratic powers as a security diamond in, in the region to, to ensure maritime security. But in his second term in 2016, he articulated that um, Indo-Pacific vision more um, comprehensively as a free and open Indo-Pacific, um, which has three pillars, ensuring the rules-based order, including a uh, rules-based economic order through uh, high standard trade regimes and digital uh, and ensuring physical and digital connectivity across the region uh, for prosperity. And then finally, uh, maintaining the rules-based order and the freedom of navigation. Um, so the key was to bring in India to this diplomatic strategic concept. But also this was the timing when the United States commitment in the region was questioned under uh, the uh, pre former president Donald Trump's uh, presidency. And also just adding on my previous comment about the previous uh, Prime Minister Abe's approach being very security focused, this uh, co new concept of FOIP, um, which some people kind of uh, use acronym, um, is much broader role, reflects a much broader um, role that, that Japan expects India to play in the region beyond security. And even as a, a kind of like a geoeconomic actor to counterbalance China's growing revisionist um, also in the economic realm. And also um, over the past years, the border clash between China and India um, and also the COVID-19 um, has, has really shifted um, India's perceptions in China as, as you can see in how, how India pulled out from uh, arrangements between Chinese companies like Huawei and even Chinese digital app companies and banned them completely from, from India um, after these incidents. That also kind of at raised expectations, not just Japan, Japan, but also um, also the United States and the kind of quad countries that India is going to um, be more willing to co openly cooperate with them. So 
that leads to my second point. So what has actually changed after um, India's kind of um, responses towards the current ongoing crisis in Ukraine? So sure, many in Tokyo must have been quite shocked um, given the recent developments around the, around the Quad and the developments in terms of institutionalization as well and the, the, the wide kind of variety of topics that is tackling um, that India um, um, it is not necessarily going to be aligned on, on, on some of the key uh, geopolitical issues that these quad countries are facing. But at the same time, for, from Japan's perspective, um, it's, it's um, a very interesting and important uh, event that I would highlight is the Prime Minister Kishida's visit to India um, this month um, really shows the clear message that Japan is willing um, to to. Japan is willing to and continue to work with um, India on on the ensuring and maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific. And the two countries also affirm the importance of bilateral and plurilateral partnerships among like-minded countries in the region and the Quad. It's quite significant given the timing um, and also um, um, it also affirmed series of um, um, security cooperation going on between the two countries, but also um, the Quad and, and talked about how the Quad has very much developed um, um, over the past years. And then, um, and then um, of course, um, at the, well, so partly the, the reasons behind this probably is that Japan, although it, it's uh, probably might have been quite shocked about um, or or uh, disappointed like like the other you know United States and, and European countries in the West about um, India's response. At the same time, in my observation, it seems like Japan probably uh, has a realistic understanding on India's where India's position in terms of geopolitics and economic realities. So um, it probably understands the um, geopolitical realities that India faces in its border. As I mentioned, you know, it has this border clash between China and 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 not just that, but um, we also need to um, um, one cannot forget the U.S. pulling out from Afghanistan and how that also changes security dynamics um, in, around the Indian borders. Um, so that really complicates um, the, the, the relationship that it has with Russia. Also understands the economic realities that India faces, the defense exports, um, that it, um, and the defense ties, defense equipment ties that it has as with Russia. Um, but even on geoeconomic issues like ensuring the economic order, it also uh, understands that India has its own domestic economic challenges that makes it very difficult for uh, it to, for instance, uh, join uh, regional economic agreements like the RCEP or other uh, digital um, um, kind of data free and flow with trust kind of approach uh, to data transfer that is going to be really the key for the next uh, trade um, rules. And then the, the last point is um, I think um, very briefly about AUKUS. I mean, Japan is not part of AUKUS, but I would say Japan, uh, just observing Japan's responses, um, it's probably um, what Japan Japan has been quite clear that it welcomes uh, the AUKUS as a very important uh, counterweight to um, China's uh, assertiveness in the region, but also very interestingly, probably um, really the AUKUS was really the key to convince that UK is, in, is actually tilting into the region. Um, so um, that was a send a really clear message about uh, UK being more willing and comfortable about and about being more open to its position on China. But at the same time, I would end my uh, um, my remarks by saying that it's quite probably too early um, if we were thinking about discussing about how to link, how, what the linkages might look like between the Quad uh, and, and AUKUS. Um, it's the, probably the, the, the timeline is very different and Quad, uh, you know, given the maturity uh, that the Quad has become over the past years and um, AUKUS, there might be some linkages around the critical technology cooperation and that Quad is pursuing and AUKUS might be pursuing the future, but I would say that there's still a lot of uncertainties um, to discuss this topic. I'll end my comments here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuka. Uh, that, that, was, that was really very, very interesting in terms of creating the, the context of this uh, discussion. I'm delighted to welcome Frederick Greer. Frederick, we, I've already introduced you at, at the beginning of the event and announced that you would be joining 
in due course. Uh, you're next to speak, so I'll reintroduce you since you've just joined, also because I can see in front of me on the YouTube uh, live stream that uh, there are people who have joined uh, since since I began um, the, the event. So I'm going to introduce you, you once again. Uh, but before that, if I could remind those who, who had, who've just joined in, that please do feel free to ask questions through the chat function on, on YouTube, and we'll post those questions in due course to the speakers. Frederick Greer is Senior Policy Fellow at the Asia Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations with expertise in security issues concerning South Asia, the Indo-Pacific and related issues. Uh, we, I'm very grateful because Frederick has just come from one online event to another one. So Frederick, thank you very much for accommodating both. And we look forward to your comments. You have about eight minutes. Thank you very much. I'm not sure that I have anything particularly new or original to say, but let me say by start by saying that there is something bizarre in the systematic juxtaposition of the terms quad, occurs, the Indo-Pacific, because they clearly represent different things and they are, of course, related. But it's not as if they did epitomize the uh, neither quad nor AUKUS they did epitomize the Indo-Pacific, which the juxtaposition, sorry, precisely suggests. They have neither the same contact nor membership. They both partly give it some substance, but reduce its scope at the same time. They both evolve, and that's probably the only real thing that they have in common around the United States, and for that reason, fall within the US vision of the Indo-Pacific. But they also reflect to a large extent that that's probably more interesting, the US limitation. And for the same reason, they do not really meet the needs of all, and perhaps not even the majority of the countries from the Indo-Pacific. As the real ambivalence of some of them, and when I say that that includes India, which is a member of the Quad, but keeps insisting on the fact that Quad is not and cannot become a military alliance, uh, which he wouldn't join anyway if it were an alliance. And, uh, and AUKUS is neither an alliance either. In this perspective, uh, since we've been asked to assess the impact of Ukraine, it may be a little premature, but there is a risk that it may precisely end up reducing the Indo-Pacific to the core constituency of the Quad. Uh, maybe not the whole of AUKUS, but in any case to a configuration that a country like India would most likely be uncomfortable with. Let me elaborate a little bit. First of all, there is no such thing as a rise of the Indo-Pacific as the title indicates. There is a rise of China that the Indo-Pacific concept and the various strategies that have been elaborated within this framework are supposed to help mitigate, but that's a different thing. Indeed, <clears throat> the Indo-Pacific is primarily a strategic concept aimed at managing the rise of China. It is by no means a geographical concept. And the best evidence of this is that the fact is the fact that all countries or entities which have defined the, an Indo-Pacific strategy or vision or outlook have given the same geographical translation, have not given, sorry, the same geographical translation to the concept. To stay within the Quad, India, Australia, of the US, to mention just some members of it, have different geographical definition of it, and that's just normal. You know? And there is enough for Quipro to work on Quipro here without having to uh, uh, say this is the same reality. Second, the Quad is essentially a strategic security dialogue between Australia, India, Japan, and the United States that is maintained by talks between member countries. If shared maritime security concerns were the prime reason for its creation in 2007, it has subsequently evolved to include in its 2021 exercise cooperation over the COVID-19 pandemic, vaccine production, space, cyber, 5G deployment. But it also evolved in its meaning. Remember that if there was such a gap between 2007 and 2017, it's because Australia dropped out of it uh, because of its own position vis-a-vis -vis China. And saying that is not criticizing Australia for that, it's just describing a reality. Many observers, though, do want to see the Quad as a security organization and underline the parallel development of the Quad 
and the bilateral military cooperation between most, but not all, uh, members. And because of these parallels, they tend to equate one with the other. It is worth noting, for example, that India, again, does not have a strategic partnership with the UK, despite the latest best efforts. But if it's true that the Quad has a strategic intent, it is by no means a security organization, at least not in the eyes of some members. Um, India, again, has repeatedly emphasized the fact that the Quad is not a security organization, but a broad partnership. It has tried to ensure that the Malabar exercise did not appear as the military arm of the Quad in the same spirit, and its refusal of Australia's participation for a while, even though Australia was indeed included in the last exercise, either to reassure India or because they believe what they say, I and mean, I'm never too sure, all of members say the Quad now and the Malabar exercises are unrelated, uh, which is in a way interesting. Third, AUKUS. AUKUS is simply a structure, an arrangement to quote British ambassadors between the three participant countries, US, UK, Australia, to share intelligence sensitive military technologies, including cyber and quantum technology, as well as nuclear propulsion. But it's worth noting that irrespective of its own merit and the nature of intensity of the Chinese threat uh, has indeed changed over the past few years, AUKUS does contribute also to the growing polarization of the region, something that most, uh, at least a number of regional states do not feel comfortable with. It does more or less force participating countries as well to align with US objectives. And if we look at what has actually happened with AUKUS, this has been a complete alignment of, uh, of Australia and the UK to uh, US objective, without really getting reinsurances about the US commitment about the region. Not that the reinsurance doesn't exist, but it's linked exclusively to the, uh, to the uh, US word, which I don't doubt, by the way, but it's simply linked to that. And there is no structural mechanism that would make sure that this commitment remains whatever exists. The Quad and AUKUS are differently, definitely two different animals, but it's worth noting again that even if one does consider their relative complementarity, they do not cover the whole spectrum of threat and challenges that the Indo-Pacific is facing. AUKUS is a security arrangement, while if the Quad is not limited to security issues, it has basically no economic component and therefore cannot meet the Chinese challenge. It is was very significant that China decided to formally apply to the CPTPP the day after the announcement of AUKUS. Now, what the uh, Indo-Pacific AUKUS and the Quad again have in common is the centrality of the US. But this centrality is bringing in the weakness of the US as much of its strengths. I was mentioning the absence of economic content in the Quad. Well, you know, for obvious domestic political compulsion, the US is unlikely to rejoin the CPTPP in the foreseeable future, leaving the space wide open for greater Chinese economic role in the region. As for the consequences of the Ukraine crisis, they are still unclear and will depend very much on the lengths of the conflict. Nevertheless, we can already observe a few things. First of all, the proximity between China and Russia, but not exclusively, de facto makes it an Indo-Pacific issue, but so far pretty ambivalent one. Because if China was probably happy and comfortable over the Ukraine crisis, as long as Russia remained outside Ukraine, this is now a very different story, as the support to Russia is de facto weakening one of the pillars of China foreign policy, the sacrosanct principle of respect for sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. But also expose China to the risk of secondary sanctions. It has moreover demonstrated so far a level of European and Western resolve and unity that was probably unexpected. But if you are a country like India, you may wonder what the longer term impact of all this will be on the Western commitment to the Indo-Pacific concept. There will most likely be a debate about resource allocation and burden sharing between the European and Asian theaters. So, what also about national European interests manifested for the Indo-Pacific? 
So is it likely to reduce the Indo-Pacific debate essentially to the constituent of the uh, of AUKUS and the Quad? Probably not, but that's a question worth asking, at least for the sake of argument. And the response to this question seems to be so far to go in the right direction. Whenever you ask in Europe whether Ukraine has killed the Indo-Pacific concept and by extension the Indo-Pacific strategy, the answer is no, because the China question will remain there. And because the China question will remain there, attention may be focused elsewhere. And indeed, it is focused elsewhere right now. But there'll be no way to avoid this question in the future. Whatever that means in practical term in the future is very unclear, and I'll be the first to admit it. But I mean, uh, as I will admit that the, uh, this answer so far has been both insufficient and insatisfactory. Nevertheless, it, is, it was a step in the, in the right direction, and this will likely continue, not out of, let's say, goodwill, but out of compulsion. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, can I just say, since, since uh, we were the ones who were sort of putting this event together, your, your, your point uh, at the beginning about why one would bring together Quad, AUKUS, and, and Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. on, on, in one event is that very well made and very well taken. But one of the important reasons, since this is a South Asia center and India is in South Asia, one of the reasons that we decided to include it was only because of India's discomfort with AUKUS and the conversations that were happening about whether or not uh, the, the forging of AUKUS was either going to affect impact or was going to dilute uh, the value of Quad for, for India. But, but what you say is absolutely uh, very well well made and, and very well taken. And we, no doubt we'd come, come back to, the, to that as we will, I hope, come back to the question of China um, and how China is now seen it, after the last four and a half weeks, uh, as you rightly drew attention to. Now, uh, we have Christopher, uh, who is a US expert, and we have Harsh, who's an India expert. And I'm wondering whether we should break rules and ask Christopher to speak first and then let Harsh speak at the very end. Would that be fine, Christopher? You need to uh, unmute yourself. No, you're still muted. Right, okay. Like Peter, I still have these uh, problems with uh, online technology. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nilanjan. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, the joint letter that was uh, published by the Russian and Chinese ambassadors. So it was the first joint statement uh, on the 29th of November last year, which called for uh, a polycentric world to replace the so-called uh, liberal rules uh, bound uh, uh, order. Now, of course, the two countries, uh, China and, and Russia have been talking about this since 2012. Uh, I think there's a certain urgency. And what we've seen, uh, particularly over Ukraine, is that there isn't a Chinese-Russian alliance but there is certainly an alignment. And I think what's happening in the Ukraine makes that alignment more urgent, both for Russia and possibly for China. Now, why the two ambassadors uh, issued this statement was first of all, because of the democracy summit in Washington the next day, uh, which concentrated Russia's mind. And secondly, the security, growing security partnership between the Western countries, uh, AUKUS in, in, in particular. Uh, and Ukraine, I think, has probably speeded up the cooperation between the two countries. Now, let's just go back to AUKUS in the grand scheme of things. I mean, why is it important for the United States? Partly budgetary reasons. The United States Navy maintains only nine aircraft carrier groups at the moment, and they're facing a, a challenge to maintain that number. The uh, 2016 uh, goal, which was 355 ships, has already been scrapped and a new fleet architecture is in, prep, in preparation. It's in the pipeline. We're not quite sure what it's going to look like. So I suppose having a British aircraft carrier with an air wing of F-35s is quite useful and having Australian submarines is also useful. Um, 
But I think for the UK, um, Peter was talking about the UK, it should also be seen in the broader context of the Ang of Anglo-Japanese uh, cooperation, and particularly in the air combat systems that he, he mentioned, because there is a technological element to all of this, which we shouldn't forget. Uh, Alcas does involve uh, cooperation on artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Uh, and the uh, relationship with Japan between uh, Britain and Japan is uh, does involve uh, technology sharing. So I think this gives um, uh, the Indo-Pacific a relevance for the United Kingdom it hasn't actually had in 50 years. Now, is AUKUS a security plus for the United States? That's a question mark that needs to be asked because there are costs. Um, I think Asians are critical. And once again, the US is outsourcing security to two English speaking countries. I and mean, even the Japanese must ask why they don't have privileged access to the Five Eyes Agreement. There's a suspicion of the Anglosphere and still memories of uh, Australia calling itself the deputy sheriff, as it did uh, in the Bush administration. Um, also, Quad and Alcus asks Asians to take sides, and Asians don't like taking sides. Uh, they're not part of the Atlantic Euro group, which has been taking sides for 70 years now. Uh, India doesn't want to take sides, and India's position on Ukraine has created certain strategic dilemmas, because obviously India wants to remain fairly close to Russia. But I suspect that a closer Russia-China alignment is a nightmare for uh, Indian um, uh, strategists, but we'll learn more about this uh, at the moment, the point is that India wants to be the major naval power in the Indian Ocean in the future, and I think was pretty cheesed off by the AUKUS agreement. It's an open question whether the political leaders in all three AUKUS countries have asked themselves about the political after effects of this relationship. Um, is it resilient enough to survive changes in political administration in the three countries? It's a big question. Uh, are the interests those three countries share in the Indo-Pacific robust enough to justify the escalating financial costs of this agreement? Because there will be costs and they will be escalating. Um, is it going to prompt China to take countermeasures? Um, we already, of course, there's a naval partnership between Russia, China and Iran and exercises quite recently between those three countries, which is changing the balance of power in the Persian Gulf. And of course, the Chinese could invest more in the South Pacific if they really wanted to do so, although this is likely to provoke France and bring the French perhaps uh, into the partnerships that we're discussing. But I think one thing is clear uh, from the United Kingdom's point of view is that China is not just a systemic, systemic threat, as the European Union uh, described it two years ago to the European project, but it's a strategic threat uh, to uh, Europe itself. And that, I think, uh, positions the UK in the forefront of not just being the most Russophobic country, as the Russians have recently accused the UK of being, but probably the most anti-Chinese European country. Quite a reversal from what happened under a previous conservative government a few years ago. Um, what is uh, AUKUS, AUKUS? I mean, I think you'll find it in that foreign affairs article by uh, Rush Doshi, uh, who, of course, is uh, Biden's NSC China man and protege of Kurt Campbell, who was responsible for the pivot towards Asia. It's what he calls in this article, a bespoke partnership, which focuses on specific questions. In other words, it's what alliances of the future are going to look like. Not alliances at all, in fact, but alignments on a temporary basis, case by case, where countries have interests in common, certainly not value-based, uh, but very specifically, interest based. But the three questions I think that uh, it raises is, is it a quick fix until other strategic options uh, arise, whatever they might be? Is it a paper tiger until the US con concedes primacy in the Indo-Pacific to China in order to avert World War III? Is it, or is it the first step towards World War III? Because I think the biggest challenge is that these type of relationships now are seen to be a pushback uh, against China, a kind of concerted uh, Western strategy, which in the light of the West's pushback against Russia, which has surprised everyone, including the West in the last four weeks, uh, suggests that a new historical period might have arisen and that we're moving from what uh, 
even Khrushchev says is a post-Cold War to a pre-war uh, situation. Uh, and that uh, would be dangerous because it uh, may encourage the Chinese to tighten control over the waters around Taiwan. Um, it will take 10 to 15 years for Alcas to be strategically significant in military terms. In other words, the clock is ticking. Uh, and China is much better placed now to uh, move on Taiwan than it will be in, say, 10 or 15 years time. So the worry, I think, about these strategic relationships is what happens between now and then. And that, for me, is, from a historical perspective, the most important question um, about uh, this uh, relationship. But of course, it's a question that only historians in the future looking back are really best equipped to answer. We are not, but we can speculate. Thank you, Milanjan. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, could I just say before I invite Harsh that we have a question um, that I can see in front of me, which is on China and the Solomon Islands, but I'm not quite sure it's a question. It seems more like a comment. So whoever's asked the question, if you could actually specify what your question is, and we'd, I'll be happy to pose it, bearing in mind that it needs to have relevance to, to what is being uh, discussed in, in this event and not just Ch China and China's activities and so on and so forth. But uh, I'm now going to invite uh, Harsh, who's our last speaker, uh, so so, and just very briefly reintroduce Harsh, who is Professor Harsh Pant, who is Professor of International Relations at King's India Institute, King's College London, and also Director of Studies and Head Strategic Studies Program at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Harsh, uh, please speak now. You have about eight minutes. Thanks, thanks, Ilanjan, and it was uh, thank you for making me part of this conversation. It was wonderful to hear uh, all. Uh, panelists uh, and, and their views on, 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 I think, a topic that is still evolving. But I'll also start from, you know, something that you suggested earlier, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, in the, the flurry of activity that, and I'm sitting here in New Delhi at the moment, and the flurry of active diplomatic activity that you see is quite unprecedented. You know, of course, uh, there is something happening in Ukraine, and, and, and uh, there's a crisis there, and uh, it, the crisis with global uh, implications, uh, but the kind of focus that India has generated and India's response has generated is perhaps uh, interesting from an academic point of view. As academics, we can look back, look at it, and and try to make sense of it. But I think uh, from a policy point of view, also it underscores. Uh, the challenges that I think Indian foreign policy is undergoing and the changes that are underway in Indian foreign policy, some of them perhaps are underappreciated, uh, that how far India has traveled in terms of its own uh, foreign policy aspirations uh, and in terms of its own foreign policy articulation. But uh, but I'll come to that in a bit. Just I, I'll start by talking very briefly on the Indo-Pacific and where India comes to it. Uh, and then, of course, Quad and I and, uh, like uh, Christopher's point, uh, you know, which, which he was quoting uh, a rush on uh, on what kind of alliances we are looking at and what that therefore what quad means uh, and uh, and perhaps uh, india's position on ukraine uh, is uh, might uh, might it might be as surprising as as perhaps some might think uh, it is because it seems to fall within the within a certain kind of a framework uh, that if you understand quad well you would understand that these you know that this is perhaps going to continue to happen but you know what what indo pacific does is 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 uh, is it in fundamental, uh, in, in, in a transformative way, brings India to the center stage of, uh, of Asian discussions. Uh, there, was a, there was a time, and in London, you sit in a South Asia center, uh, you know, we all have taught in South Asia centers where it used to be as if South Asia is a distinct entity almost cut off from East and Southeast Asia. You know, you used to talk of Asia Pacific and South Asia. This was, this was the geography that was often used in policy terms, in academic terms, the way we defined our mental maps. Uh, and where I think India was, was not seen or largely being seen as, 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 a, as part of a certain geography. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the, the rest of Asia is part of a certain geography. And, and to understand and India's role, therefore, became uh, part of it uh, because of India's own uh, foreign policy aspirations always being uh, pegged with Pakistan, but also, uh, you know, is part of its own uh, non-aligned historical legacy. In short, that uh, you know, that the the, the, the foreign policy uh, outlook for India uh, was constrained by the way we were looking at the world, where we were looking or trying to understand uh, the larger geography in this part of the world. So, what you know, what Indo-Pacific does is is that it brings India to the center of that discussion. And Yuka pointed out how Shinzo Abe started off this discussion of the confluence of the two seas and this 
idea that if you're looking at the balance of power evolving, and I think Frederick is, is absolutely on the mark, that this is, you know, if there would not have been China's rise, we would not be discussing Indo-Pacific. I, I think China's rise and the transformative effect economic, strategic, political, diplomatic that it has had on, uh, on Asia and, and, and the globe uh, may, has made it very difficult to, to look at these geographies distinctly. Uh, th therefore, uh, you know, China's rise made it a veritable necessity uh, to, to look at the region uh, as a whole, to look at Indo-Pacific as a, as a single maritime construct where if you want to transform the balance of power, if you want to stabilize the balance of power, if you want to stabilize power politics, then it was important to bring India into the fold. And I think uh, what Shinzo Abe laid out in his conference of the two seas later on became a template for many other countries to imbibe and to think about the region. And as we started thinking and, and, and operationalizing it into policy, uh, you know, whether it was free and open Indo-Pacific uh, of Japan, whether it was Indo-Pacific outlook of, of, uh, of uh, Australians, as well as of the ASEAN countries. ASEAN, uh, you know, initially did not like the idea of the Indo-Pacific. And of course, uh, they, then they came out with, a, with an outlook. And of course, India's own articulation of this by uh, Prime Minister Modi at Shangri-La uh, uh, in 2018, where he talked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what it would look like uh, and what, what, he, what India would see in terms of... Uh, the Indo-Pacific narrative, you know, rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific, free, open, and secure uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region uh, where rules of the, uh, you know, uh, where international law is followed. And I think to frame it in normative terms uh, has been uh, the, the way forward for India. And that has sort of brought India uh, and, and some of the like-minded countries together, whether it was the four quad countries or whether it is countries like, you know, like uh, France or, or UK that have had uh, European countries that have started looking at uh, Indo-Pacific uh, through, through the strategic lens. So I think a lot of it has been about China's rise, but a lot of it has been about also the resilience uh, and the pushback by countries like India uh, which, uh, which at, you know, uh, beyond the point felt that they had to stand up and carve out a space for themselves beyond just the US-China rivalry that was becoming the dominant narrative. So I think a lot of the countries uh, and, and uh, Japan, Australia, India, uh, ASEAN, they have played an important role in terms of shaping, shaping that narrative in their own ways. Now, uh, of course, Frederick also pointed out the fact that Quad started gaining ground in 20, in 2007. That was the first time we heard of the Quad, Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. But then it disappeared very, very quickly. Uh, party Australians didn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, did not want to go along, and also Indians did, did not want to go along. The idea was that why, uh, why do we want to antagonize the Chinese uh, too much? Ch China can be managed. Uh, if China can be managed, then uh, let us also give that space to the Chinese. It turned out that China could not be managed individually. Uh, so uh, from 2007 to 2017, China's behavior became even more aggressive. And so by 2017, when you saw the re resurrection of Quad. Uh, that was that was uh, a moment where perhaps uh, there was a greater reflection both in Canberra and New, New Delhi about the possibilities that it brings to the table. Uh, and of course, 2021 in particular has been an inflection point where uh, in, in a matter of a year, we have uh, there, were, there were two leaders level summits uh, of, which, of, of Quad laying out an agenda for the Quad. Now here, I think uh, what is interesting from India's point of view is, is what Christopher was talking about earlier as to... Uh, bespoke uh, alliances or alignments. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, Indian leadership or Indian policymakers now define their foreign policy in terms of issue-based alignments. Uh, they are, you know, the argument is that we are no longer non-aligned. So non-alignment should not be the frame of reference for India's foreign policy aspirations around the globe. What is important is that we are willing to align with like-minded countries on, on, on the basis of uh, vital uh, interests that we have. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, the, quad, uh, the quadrilateral security dialogue, uh, which was which emerged as a was is, is widely seen uh, as an issue based arrangement uh, as, as an arrangement that has uh, that, you know, that has a certain um, potency in certain areas, which will work uh, where India would work with like minded countries like Japan, Australia and US uh, on issues of uh, common interests. And therefore, uh, I think to misunderstand this as an alliance. Uh, from the very beginning would be would be a you know uh, would, would lead us in, in, into directions where perhaps uh, I, I don't think the four countries want to go. 
or would ideally like to go. Australia and J Japan are alliance partners of the US, traditional alliance partners of the US. India is not. So any free, and India is not likely to be an alliance partner. There is no political appetite within the country uh, for India to enter into uh, alliance relationships. So I think what Quad gives is that flexibility to a country like India to enter into these issue-based alignments. And uh, these minilaterals, these plurilaterals uh, are, you know, are, uh, uh, now burgeoning in Asia Pacific. So there are lots of trilaterals, uh, you, you know, France is part of many, uh, UK is part of many, uh, US, Japan, Australia, India, there is Japan, uh, Australia, Indonesia. So there are a range of these trilaterals, uh, bilaterals uh, and quadrilateral, uh, one quadrilateral, and then you can add AUKUS to it, uh, which are proliferating in the region. Uh, and I think this is in some ways a response to this, uh, to this institutional vacuum that uh, a geography like Indo-Pacific suffers from. Uh, so it is now seen as a strategic reality, but it is, it is also devoid of, of, uh, of institutional frameworks uh, where, uh, which can manage the transition that is happening in the Indo-Pacific. So I think we are looking at some of these ad hoc coalitions that are emerging. Uh, as, 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 as one way of managing this, how successful they will be, whether they will be able to manage China, whether they will be able to uh, manage the transition of uh, power in the region, that remains to be seen. But I think uh, one of the ways to understand this is to look at these as, as a response uh, to some of the challenge. So when, so when you know, Ukraine comes, uh, I'm, you know, uh, I would say that, uh, it, you know, while um, uh, it is certainly, you know, and when we hear this uh, in, from, from certain capitals, world capitals, that, that uh, you know, Americans are disappointed uh, or uh, European partners are disappointed. I would say that I think basing that disappointment on Quad perhaps is not the right approach because Quad was never uh, from the very beginning entrusted to be an alliance framework where all four partners would agree on everything. Uh, but where I think uh, the disappointment perhaps comes from is this idea that this is now a great power contestation as defined by some countries between democracies and authoritarian states. And so where would India stand? Where would India go? And I think there, the, there might be questions around the feasibility of India's present position uh, and how long can India sustain that position? and whether uh, India's ability to uh, attract both Western countries as well as Russia uh, remains uh, something that, uh, you know, uh, that, that is sustainable. My, uh, very briefly, my own take on this question uh, is slightly different uh, in terms of if, if you are looking at India-Russia relationship today, uh, it is a pale match for India-Russia relationship uh, of the Cold War days. If uh, if you if you go back to the uh, you know to the period when Cold War ended, Soviet Union disappeared. India was almost eighty percent, eighty five percent reliant on uh, Russian imports. Today it is it has come down to fifty five percent. So there is there is a even on defense. Uh, we have seen India diversifying. Uh, the you know America, Israel, France, uh, European Union, uh, multiple partners uh, as far as. India's defense aspirations are concerned and, and multiple partners playing a very important role in, in India's defense matrix. So it's not the same defense policy of India that used to be in the 1990s, that, that used to be during the Cold War. But the problem that India faces in its Russia relationship is that it is a relationship fundamentally in decline. It is a relationship where, uh, where if you compare that relationship to any other relationship that is vibrant, especially to its Western partners, you see a relationship that is unidimensional. It is, it is simply on, the, on, on defense that this relationship is, has been resurrected. And I think the leaderships on the two sides recognize that. Uh, what, is, what seems to be happening is that there is an attempt to manage this, de this decline as elegantly as possible. Whether, that, uh, whether, whether they are able to do that eventually remains to be seen. But I think uh, that the challenge for both countries is that apart from defense, there is nothing else is driving this relationship. And so when something like Ukraine happens, it exposes India to a lot of vulnerabilities, which is one, it's defense reliance. Of course, India is, uh, you know, if you are standing across the border along, uh, along the LAC, with Chinese soldiers uh, uh, mobilized uh, in, in big numbers, uh, it's very difficult to, to uh, antagonize Russia. And I think that's, a, that's an operational reality that India is facing. But I think on the question of China-Russia axis also, India feels very strongly that it wants to have a channel of communication open with Russia. Uh, China-Russia relationship is going to become stronger. I would just uh, you know, add that uh, more than China, 
it has been, Russia has been much more vocal in terms of its in, when it comes to expressing its displeasure about the con, Indo-Pacific construct about Quad. Uh, it, it is it is Russian uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov who has uh, you know been uh, very very critical of this uh, of these ideas and in India. So you know he has been very very vocal uh, about his opposition about Russia's opposition to these ideas uh, and and. Uh, I think once again underscoring the challenge that that India and and Russia face uh, in their relationship. But I think India wants to continue as long as it can to to have that channel of communication open with Russia as the fundamental power transition takes place globally and with Russia China access becoming much much stronger. So I think by and large what we are witnessing is uh, is India being caught uh, at a particularly vulnerable time when it is uh, facing the facing the Chinese onslaught on the border as well as trying to develop relationships with its Western partners on the basis of certain uh, commonality of interests and convergence of interests in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Ukraine crisis, many others have pointed out, will have an impact. It will not, uh, you know, what happens in Europe will not remain in Europe. It will have its impact in Indo-Pacific. But how it pans out, I think these are still early days. My own uh, final submission would be that I think India's role in the Indo-Pacific as India defines itself uh, will continue to grow. Uh, and it would rely on, in a, in a large part, uh, in its ability to convince its like-minded partners to work with uh, India on uh, issue-based coalitions in the absence of larger, uh, more broader institutional frameworks that are at the moment not available in the Indo-Pacific. So the only option available is to have these minilaterals and trilateral arrangements to work with. But by and large, I think the Indo-Pacific is going to be the theater where India would feel that it, it, it has to project power in a, in a way, both uh, with the help of, of its partners, but also to ensure that Chinese power projection, both in the Indian Ocean and on the continent, uh, remains measured, that it can be contained, and that can only happen if it, if it has robust partnerships uh, across the world, and in particular with, in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Harsh. I'm just going to ask all the others if they want to come in to say anything. But before that, this is partly by way of clarification, but partly also to push you a bit more on what you've said. When you started off, uh, you, know, you were making the very valid point, and you're absolutely right in saying that when one works like I do, something which is a research center that has a regional name to it, like uh, South Asia, and there are other such. Um, there has been a change uh, in terms of identifying the region or, or investing that region uh, with greater importance than had been earlier. That, you know, that, that, that was something you started off with. By the end of uh, what you said, by way of your remarks, um, I was curious to ask you further, are you, given that you are saying that the whole question of non-alignment that had so marked India's foreign policy through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, is no longer the path that is being taken, are you saying that at the same time, the attention that India is getting even today, just literally today, when I say today, are you saying that India is by, by wanting to pursue an issue-based relationships strategy across the world uh, with the intention of trying to keep and measure China's uh, expansion. And as you very well know, China's expansion is not only in and around South Asia, but is also on, on Africa's coast. Um, there's a question about Solomon Islands. Um, are you saying that India is actually not a powerful power broker, but is navigating its path and, and forging um, a, a policy? So it is still something that is quite nascent in the making, given that the larger politics of the Indo-Pacific and of South and East Asia as the traditional reference categories has changed so dramatically because of, of the rise of China? Uh, you know, I, I think so. See, uh, the, the, the reality is that Indo-Pacific, and I think uh, someone mentioned this point that have you know, different countries have different interpretations and different uh, definitions of the Indo-Pacific, but by whatever definition you take, it's, it's a huge geography. 
And I don't think any one country uh, can manage uh, the turbulence in the Indo-Pacific on its own. But of course, India is, uh, you know, India has its own focus areas. And in particular, I think Indian Ocean is, uh, is Western Indian Ocean in particular is one area where India is particularly focused on. Uh, but, uh, and I think the idea is that given the white, you know, given the, uh, the, the seemingly uh, humongous nature of this geography, uh, the best possible alternative is for countries to work together uh, in, in terms of ensuring that, uh, you know, that responsibilities are shared. Uh, and, and I think it is in that spirit that we see uh, European partners working with like-minded countries as well in the region. So I think this is not simply an India question. This is a wider question about how do you manage the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and in, in the management of the Indo-Pacific uh, will have to be done based on this, this sense that, look, this is a wide geography, uh, different countries, uh, different powers have different interests here. But wherever you can find commonality, you can develop partnerships that can help you in managing this transition. Uh, and, and I would and, and I would agree that I think it's uh, India is at the moment still if, if you look at uh, uh, the challenge that India faces along the border with China and I mean in the comparable advantages with China I mean India is, is, is no match in terms of quantitative and qualitative developments of the, just share military power you, know, you don't have to go even beyond that but I think there the idea is that you know one can uh, hold on to what uh, to what one has in terms of uh, territory or one one can deter China through a, through a power projection, but I think wider maritime space that is available to India, where India has, for example, in the Indian Ocean, certain geographical advantages, where other countries have power projection abilities, which are like-minded, whether India can work with those countries and create a more stable balance of power. And I think that's a very similar assessment that, that perhaps uh, is there in London or in Paris, uh, or even in Washington, uh, despite the fact that Washington is, 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 is a much global player in that sense. But I think given that they are also facing resource constraints, how do you manage this transition? And that is one of the reasons why um, you know, this, this debate about, uh, about uh, India becomes that much more interesting and uh, both from academic and policy perspective that can, uh, can you isolate India as well? You know, often you hear from Washington that uh, you know, uh, increasingly, even on the Ukraine question, and that look, we understand where India is coming from. And I think that understanding where India is coming from has to do with, with the basic fact that India is one of the few countries that, that needs both Russia and the Western countries to manage China. Uh, in, the, in the short term, uh, I don't think uh, you know, India can afford antagonizing Russia given its import dependence, defense dependence. And in the long term, it needs its Western partners in the Indo-Pacific. Now, how do you square this circle given what is happening in Ukraine? I think that's going to be the diplomatic challenge in the coming uh, days and months ahead. Um, thank you. Did, did, uh, Frederick, did you want to come in to say something? You need to unmute yourself. Sorry. I don't really have anything to come in particular. Uh, I, I don't even think that uh, managing the present situation, the present diplomatic situation for India will be that difficult in any case. Uh, most countries, at least those who understand India a little bit, understand the compulsions. Uh, it doesn't, the reality is perhaps slightly different when it comes to Russia. The question is not to uh, articulate Russia and uh, cooperation with the Western countries in the Indo-Pacific is to make sure that Russia doesn't turn into a nuisance, which is the actual evolution of the India-Russia uh, uh, relations and the real problem that the uh, Indian diplomacy is faced with right now. And because of that, will it be complicated? It has been complicated for a while. I mean, uh, Putin himself was kind enough to remind India not so long ago that, you know, it has options too, and did invite, <laughs> they invited the Pakistani, uh, not delivering anything, but just sending the right signal to Delhi and so on. And there were other signals as well. But there has been, interestingly, a very uh, a quasi-complete reversion of what the process was since the late 90s, when India and China received the same technology, at least the same platform from, uh, from Russia, but the technology was superior on, uh, on India's platform. Then came the time where the technology was just equal on the other thing. Now comes the possibility 
that the technology that is being delivered to India may be slightly less than the one which is being delivered to, to China. And there the problem is, but we have gone from a partnership to the fear of any results. And that's not exactly the same kind of relation. And as for the choice, I think the choice has been made on the Indian side. Now, there are compulsion, there are nature that you described, and uh, I will probably leave a little go further than you on this, but nevertheless, that's the way we see it. So how complicated is it going to be for India? Well, there'll be noise around, not for long, probably. Let's see how things unfold. Um, you're, of course, referring to the visit by Pakistan's prime minister to Moscow. Yeah, of course. Um, I was going to ask Peter um, if, if he wanted to come in to say something, but I just wanted to also say, looking at the screen, that um, the, the presence that's been mentioned by everyone is China, and there's a sense in which everything that is being talked about for the region in terms of geostrategy and um, geopolitical importance has to do with China, China's actions, China's rise, et cetera, et cetera. And how different people are, uh, different countries are responding to it or, and, and seeking to, to achieve certain things. I was very struck by the fact, Christopher, that you referred to China-Russia relations as an alignment and not as an alliance. And you were, you were very clear in, in making that separation. Now, given that China is continuing to expand, and given that, uh, as, as all of you actually have in different ways said, China is unlikely to you know, walk into another country's territory and, and sort of start waging war. Um, it's you know, the whole principle of, of, of acknowledging sovereignty. Um, the, the fact that China is continuing to rise, will that become, or is that the principal factor that is determining the politics in the region, given the US's long-standing suspicion of China. Is that so? Could I go first, as you, you mentioned? Um, sure, go ahead, and then Christopher can come in. Yeah, yeah um, a couple of things. Um, I mean, on China, um, I mean, there was an attempt, I think, in the British All of Asia policy to try and not see everything through the lens of China's rise. But I mean, I'm afraid that simply became too difficult um, because of the extent of that rise and, and the scale of it. Um, I mean, in terms of what China may or may not do, um, one of the lessons I think of uh, Russia, Ukraine is that countries sometimes do things that, have, that are regarded by others as unimaginable. So I, don't, I think we should be a bit cautious um, uh, about uh, what China may or may not do next. Um, secondly, in terms of India's dilemma, um, one likely outcome of the um, current crisis, Russia-Ukraine, is that um, the Russia-China alignment, as Christopher called it, will become closer, and that Russia will become even more obviously a junior partner and therefore uh, following um, uh, China's um, wishes. So I think from an Indian perspective, they should take that into account. I mean, personally, I think um, it's more than an alignment. It's certainly less than an alliance. I think it's somewhere in between. And we've been struggling for years to find the right word. And perhaps it was Dmitry Trenin's word that's the best one, which is an entente. Um, it, it's somewhere in, in between. Um, finally, just to pick up, um, Frederick's comment um, and also Christopher's um, about these sort of groups. I mean, this movement towards smaller groupings is actually, it's to be found not only in the Indo-Pacific, but it's also to be found in the Euro-Atlantic region. And in fact, it started there. So you have a number of these groupings, whether it's the Joint Expeditionary Force or the Framework Nation, uh, there's a Mediterranean groupings, there's Northern groupings and so on. And, you know, I think that is a trend because big alliances, you know, NATO has 30 members, um, you know, they, 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 they are manageable. I don't, I'm not going to argue that they're not manageable, but they are more difficult to manage. Um, so um, those smaller groupings, I think, can be, cons I mean, this is a British view anyway, can be entirely consistent uh, with um, the broader um, arrangements as well. I think they are 
they're more than issue-based alignments. Um, and I was interested by that term that Harsh used. I think they're more interest-based and they can be capability-based. I think to describe them as issue-based possibly makes them sound too transient because um, I think they will be, they will, many of them will last for a very long time. That's what I wanted to say. Christopher. Just, just two points. Um, China doesn't do alliances uh, historically and uh, it's very, I think, skeptical about the usefulness of, uh, of, of institutional arrangements that box you in. As someone famously said about alliances, the problem is that your allies do very little for you, but they prevent you doing a lot for yourself, simply by the guilt of association. Uh, and Xi has made this point in the United Nations time and time again when he's addressed the General Assembly. The West does alliances, the, left do, the West does coalition warfare, the West does expeditionary warfare. Uh, we have partnerships, and uh, mostly trading partnerships, but what they have, I think, with Russia is something a little further than a partnership. It's a kind of ideological alignment. I stick with that. I could use the word axis, but it has negative connotations, of course, in the Western world. Um, but it falls short of being an alliance that would require them to come to Russia's aid in situations such as the present. Uh, and I think the situation that they see themselves in at the moment is going to just amplify their wish not to have an alliance with Russia, but to have a closer diplomatic alignment with it so that they can take common positions. And if, you, if you're looking at the alternative to SWIFT, uh, for example, um, the Chinese system has got about 1,200 banks as opposed to 5,500. It's, it's part of a multilateral system, which is not dollar denominated, which is, I think, uh, a long time, a long term Chinese um, uh, initiative uh, and one that Russia can be folded into quite, quite well. And as Peter says, Russia is obviously going to be the junior partner. Uh, in all of this, um, through mistakes of its own making, by the way, uh, quite recently. So anyway, that's why I say alignment. Um, but Nalanja and I, I would question you on the, of, that China's not going to march into someone else's territory. Um, it'll march into Taiwan. That is the problem for the next, uh, over the next 10 years. And if you look at the fact that the rate of economic growth in China has halved since 2007, and that its debt is a staggering 280% of GDP, and it's still not escaped from the middle income trap uh, yet, uh, unlike South Korea, Singapore, and other countries that did manage to escape within 30 years or so from the middle income trap. There is this perception. Now, this may be a Western problem that we're using Western historical analogies to apply to non-Western situations, but there is this perception in the United States in particular that China may conclude that if it doesn't act fairly soon, the historic opportunity may have passed. That was certainly the, the, the German conclusion uh, in the run up to the First World War, that they had a very limited window of opportunity and that they had to seize it. Uh, Taiwan is the big issue. Uh, Ukraine has been very healthy in this respect because it has concentrated mines in Beijing, which is divided, uh, by the way. There are three different groups in Beijing arguing that this argument has spilled over into the press no less, which shows you how animated the argument actually is about how closely aligned, to use that word, they should be with Russia on Ukraine. But there is this concern um, that, that there is a kind of Western pushback. But the third thing I would say is that the West would, I think, get a reality check if it actually looked at social media comment in Asia on Ukraine. And even those Asian governments which have decided to stand by the West and the General Assembly and elsewhere, or at least if not stand by the West, be very critical of what Russia is doing in Ukraine. This is not reflected in social media, which is overwhelmingly in favor of Russia and very, very uh, anti-Western and particularly anti-American uh, and making the usual uh, connections between Iraq and Ukraine and all the things that we can go into Western hypocrisy, Western imperialism, uh, Western uh, uh, cultural, uh, arrogance. So I think leaders in Asia will also take note of this social media uh, commentary. Uh, and this may be one of the last moments in which leaders in Asia are standing behind a Western, uh, shall we say, a, a Western uh, orchestrated uh, uh, response to what's happening in Ukraine. This may also be a limited window of opportunity for the West here as well, something that it needs to take into account. Anyway, those are the three points that I wanted to make. 
Thank you, Christopher. I should officially uh, withdraw part of what I said, and thank you both Peter and, and Christopher for correcting me, because as soon as I said it, I thought in my mind, Harsh has just said that India and China have border problems, territorial problems, and line of control. So as soon as I said it, I thought, oh, I, I probably need to backpedal. But, um, well, I, 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 I can always take refuge under the fact that my PhD is on 14th century texts. Um, so I'm no expert on, on this subject. Um, Yuka, did you want to come in? And then I'm going to just ask Harsh quickly. Sure. Um, I, I think I don't have much to add to the speakers, but I think on the China, uh, China front, I think I do agree that um, China is probably learning a lot on, you know, what the implications of the Russia's invasion in Ukraine would be um, in, in, in Taiwan. But at the same time, I'm sure the discussion in the Indo-Pacific is also um, because of what's going on in the Ukraine, a lot of focus around um in the region would be looking at what might be similar, what might be different in a Taiwan contingency scenario. I think from Japan's perspective as well, I think the discussion would rather have probably accelerated in thinking about how Japan might be thinking uh, or partnering with regional countries to approach this and what the timeline, how the timeline might have changed in China's thinking. I think if I may add on the, the kind of mini lateral groupings on its effectiveness, since uh, I think most of the speakers touched on its effectiveness um, in specific kind of military uh, security focused um, interest group, I think it's also the same when we, we think about groupings for um, not just the military technology development, but also um, you know more commercial technology development as well in the context of geoeconomics. I think I uh, touched on um, as the, the kind of um, the digital area when in my opening remarks. I think this is where we see the most significant competition between US and China um, because it will, uh, you know, who's, uh, with, what kind of digital infrastructure, including 5G and whose rules, um, you know, we're going to exchange data with is we really shape the, the future of, of, um, uh, of the, um, of the geoeconomic power of, of, of the region, but also the ability to shape the rules for the future economy. Uh, so I think this geoeconomic perspective is really important. And we've already seen that that quad is really making progress, um, for instance, about thinking about what might be an alternative cost-effective technology. And they've specifically, for instance, agreed to um, have 1.5 tracks um, on, on the, one of the key alternative technologies like the 5G at Open RAN, which basically um, is to allow multiple companies to create one network technology. So these discussions are going on because of these small groupings. Another area uh, I would, I would, I would Sorry, you've switched yourself off. Oh, thank you, sorry. I think some of the speakers mentioned that, that the lack of economic dimension of quad, I think it's, this might not be necessarily quad, but I would say some successes have also been seen in the infrastructure front as well. Um, I wanted to mention the US, Japan, it's not India yet, um, although it's included in the quad, uh, the recent work, working group in quad, but US, Australia, Japan infrastructure partnership and cooperation between these financing institutes and how it has also already made some kind of milestone achievements in funding Palau's uh, submarine cables. So, so I, I think these mini groupings are uh, and issue-based and interest-based groups are also making uh, some kind of pro progress in the region uh, in the economic front as well. I think I'll end my uh, comment here. Harsh, did you want to say anything? Um, I have one last question to ask all of you for your concluding remarks before we stop, but did you want to respond? To, to any of the things, most particularly, I think one of the things that, that hasn't quite been said, but uh, is somewhere there in this, um, is that the attention that, is, that India is receiving, something that you mentioned when, when you started to speak, include, you know, which was brought India, so center stage, that was the word you used. Um, is it because uh, India is, just happens to be, uh, the most useful uh, power, to use the word, or, or nation uh, for, for the others to reach out to and use uh, in order to 
effectualize more intensely their own ambitions. For instance, you know, this was out in the newspapers today here in Britain, that uh, one of the uh, important considerations for this trust's visit was to ensure that India did not buy too much of, of oil from Russia at, at a discounted price, because it would actually undo uh, the impact of sanctions that the West has brought upon, upon Russia. So is it that India just is, is an, happens to be a useful uh, regional entity to, to, to uh, you know, undo um, the other interests of the other powers, or is it that India is, by way of its regional dominance, which it is in the region, it is a dominant power, um, being able to hold on to its guns and carve its way around? Uh, Nilanjan, I think uh, I would say a part, uh, partly it's both, but uh, but it seems to me that, you know, uh, and many of the uh, names that we talked about as to who has come to India in recent days or not. Uh, one interesting name is also Chinese foreign minister was here last week. So, uh, so and he was here for a very short week. He did not want it to be publicized. Uh, there was all sorts of things happening around that visit, uh, but he was here nonetheless. And I think the idea that, uh, that you, Ukraine... Uh, uh, crisis has appended some of the calculations there as well. And I think what, what the Chinese were interested in was to explore whether the Ukraine crisis has given them an opportunity to portray uh, India, uh, you know, uh, as, as part of this China, Russia, India uh, trifecta of, of countries. Uh, of course, you know that there is a history there. Uh, it, Russia, China, India have been uh, part of this uh, of course, RIC platform, but then also BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa platform. So I think there is a, you know, there is a historical aspect to this, but I think this opportunity and what had happened, uh, what has happened to India-China relations in the last two years in particular, where they've completely gone off the rails and India has made some distinctive choices some very categorical choices. And India is insisting now uh, on, on uh, very clear articulation by China of, uh, in terms of its a policy on border before anything else can move ahead it indicates uh, a toughening of stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, Frederick mentioned, I think that, that, that increasingly India's choices are relatively clear. If you look carefully, you would see that uh, on all, uh, you know, in, in, in more ways than one, India is making it quite apparent as to, as to what, in, you know, where it intends to go. I think the question is, um, uh, you know, the, some of the choices in the meantime will have to be made in a much more measured way. And you really, uh, especially when it comes to defense, uh, it, it is simply, uh, it, you can't really make that change in a matter of years. It, it is going to be a long-term process. And I think India's partners will have to live with that. Uh, but, uh, but certainly those, uh, you know, as you mentioned, energy, certainly there is an interest in seeing that India does not uh, add uh, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to Russia's wealth or to Russia's economic heft, um, wherever possible. Uh, but even on that, uh, you know, uh, if you look at Europe, for example, Europe is still buying uh, Russian oil and gas, and many countries in Europe are still doing that. Uh, and it's a long-term process. For Europe also, it's a long-term process. Europe is saying that we are going to reduce our dependence eventually. We are going to wean ourselves away from Russia. But that's what India is also saying. I don't think there is that much of a difference in, 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 in that sense. But clearly, diplomatically, that puts India... Uh, you know, at the very center of these discussions. Uh, and this is uh, something that you would expect uh, at a time when geopolitical contestation is at its height. Uh, countries like India, which, which have not articulated their positions in ways that both sides would like. By the way, and India's position on Russia also has evolved. In fact, uh, the, the, the readout from the, Brit uh, the when British Prime Minister talked to Indian Prime Minister um, a, few, a few days back, uh, I think India's one of the most one of the clearest statements came out from India, where, where India said um, in the joint statement that uh, you know the stakeholders in this conflict should for, should follow UN Charter. Of course, this was directed at one you know at Russia. So clearly, I think there has been an evolution in India's stand as well. But given the constraints, I don't think India will publicly uh, come out uh, against Russia. India will not publicly sanction or isolate Russia. Um, but within those constraints, whatever can be done, I think that's the that's what diplomacy, uh, we, you know, that that's what we are witnessing in, in New Delhi at the moment. Sure, thank you. You were referring to the visit by Wang Yi to to yes, New Delhi, yes. um, and it's 
useful and important in this context, also in the context of what Frederick said earlier, that Wang Yi did go to Pakistan as well. Uh, we are out of time, but I'm going to pose one last question and that all of you answer as briefly as possible, only because I can get away with asking the question. I would hate it if someone asked me the question, um, is that we've spoken about Russia, we've spoken about India, but all of us have in different ways also spoken a lot about China. At our center, we do a lot of events as South Asia center that involves China. My question to you, and all of you can make your concluding remarks with this, is at the start of the 21st century, it was said that this century might well be called the Asian century. In geopolitical and geosecurity terms, is that possible to say? Would the 21st century be a an Asian century, given especially, I was struck by um, what Christopher said about social media reactions, because I've been following them as well. And it's, I mean, Christopher is spot on in how, how opposed it is to the kind of um, social media reactions that say, I read sitting over here in London, as opposed to seeing what's 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 coming out coming out from there. So to say it again, for geopolitical geostrategic reasons, will this be the Asian century in as much as it will dominantly determine um, geopolitics and geostrategy? Who wants to go first? Frederick. Well, actually, I don't know if it will be the Asian century and if it will be, if it will determine everything. The question is not really any longer whether it's going to be the Asian century. The question is whether it's going to be the Chinese century. And there the question is still open because everything that we see now is a reaction to that, an attempt to prevent that. Successful or unsuccessful, we will see. And I think, as Christopher was said earlier, that you know this is for historian, the future historian to to look back at the period and, uh, and say what has actually happened. But the entire effort that we see now is about preventing that. From that sense, we have you know, a shift of, we can say there is definitely a shift of the geostrategic and geoeconomic center of the world to the Pacific. But whether it will determine the future of the global system is exactly what is at stake right now. And that's what makes a real difference between, for example, a country like India and between a country like China. And that's what makes the same abstention, for example, in the UN and was given a completely different meaning. And that's where we stand for all the reasons that have been discussed and mentioned earlier. Thank you. Peter? Um, I think I rather share Frederick's um, skepticism about your comment, as it were, your, your assertion. Um, I mean, frankly, it is too early to say. Um, and um, Asia, yes, will be much more, um, well, it's already becoming um, very important, not quite dominant uh, economically, but it will that, will, that will continue. But whether that translates into um, a sort of global um, power is a different matter. Um, I think this century might be a bit like the problem that we've had with the, the Cold War and how we describe the period after the Cold War. I mean, it'll be pretty clearly no longer the Euro-Atlantic century, but that doesn't mean that it will clearly become something else. Um, it could be a, a period of um, considerable sort of division and confusion, I think. Um, that would be my, uh, my reaction. Well, we, we still have 78 years to go for the century to get over. Uh, but uh, uh, Frederick did say it would be the Chinese century. He corrected me and said Chinese century. You didn't go that far, but, but uh, that, sorry, did you want to come in to say something? Well, it, it, it may be, but not, not necessarily. I mean, as Christopher pointed out, um, China's gr economic growth is falling. Um, the demographic issues that China has are becoming increasingly clear. Um, so I don't think we should automatically assume that it would be uh, a Chinese century. Um, 
And of course, you know, this is where India has a vote. Um, I mean, India could choose to, and, and obviously, you know, people in the UK would very much hope this is the case. India could choose to um, make economic and other political choices that mean that, um, I'm not gonna say it'll become the Indian century, but it could certainly, um, India could ensure that it doesn't become the Chinese century. Okay, we're setting up the stage rather well over here. Um, Yuka, did you want to? Sure, that's a really interesting uh, and difficult uh, question because as you just mentioned, there's many more years to come until the end of the century. But it also, I think, um, um, depends on how, how we define Asia. But just looking at the snapshot right now, the fact that, um, you know, even not just the Asian countries, but also uh, countries beyond Asia are now now have the Indo-Pacific visions that we've been discussing today already suggests that, um, well, there's a general kind of common understanding that the, the, the global kind of geopolitical gravity have shifted towards the, towards the region. But also, um, I, think it, I think we shouldn't just think that this is all driven by China. Of course, many countries, uh, Indo-Pacific policies are driven um, by the, their strategic thinking to counterbalance China. But at the same time, for instance, if you look at the UK strategy towards Indo-Pacific, as since I'm in London right now as well, um, you know, it also talks and raises a lot of opportunities it hopes to achieve in Southeast Asia and the region's economic growth more in general. So I think in that context, um, I, th I think it's, it's quite, um, I think it's quite early to judge, but um, I think there's a certain direction that, and that we're seeing that uh, countries are thinking that uh, this century is going to become an Asian century. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Just, just to clarify that phrase, by the way, is not mine, but uh, I'm very happy to be held uh, for it. Um, Harsh, did you want to say anything? And then I'll ask Christopher. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, very briefly, <clears throat> it seems uh, um, in some ways what, uh, you know, uh, we are already witnessing a transition where uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, traditionally uh, Atlantic countries or European countries being moving towards the Indo-Pacific in more substantive ways than, than simply rhetoric. So I think uh, Indo-Pacific is certainly today the center of gravity of global politics and there's no getting away from it. Uh, and, and, and what we also hearing uh, repeatedly now, uh, in fact, all these visits that we've been talking about to India, there is almost an undercurrent here suggesting that, look, whatever is happening in Ukraine, uh, Indo-Pacific will continue, our, our focus will continue and the Indo-Pacific will continue to invest there. So I think there is a, there is a, certain, uh, there is a certain natural logic to that. Uh, I would say that uh, a lot, uh, uh, of course, would depend on uh, on China. China is a big power. China's rise is a reality. Uh, and a power like China really can't be contained. So, uh, you know, a lot would depend on the choices that China makes and also the choices that the countries like India, Japan, Australia, ASEAN, they make. Uh, at the end of the day, the pushback that we have seen vis-a-vis -vis China today is also a reflection that certain countries uh, in the region have decided that enough is enough, that there are certain red lines that have to be drawn. Uh, so, so clearly that pushback and China's rise uh, somewhere between that would depend whether this becomes an Asian century or not. But, you know, yeah, you, you would recall that this is, this is also something that has been going on since 1980s, when Japan started rising, we started saying, oh, this is going to be Japan's, um, you know, a century going forward and Japan would lead the way. And now and then suddenly, uh, you know, there have been various iterations of this debate, but China has certainly given us something much more concrete to hold on to. Uh, and, and given the determination with which it wants to sort of uh, challenge the existing order also means that it is interested in an alternative order, which many, many of the previous uh, contenders were not really interested in. So I think this is certainly a more interesting space in that, in that context, but much would depend not only on China, but I think also on the other countries and how they relate to that. Great. Christopher, you have the last word. Just two uh, very brief comments. I mean, um, the United States uh, became the world's largest economy in 1869 and still arguably is to this day remains it. The American century was only coined in 1942 by Henry Luce. And Henry Luce's parents uh, were missionaries in China. And Henry Luce was deeply uh, convinced that America would only be able to uh, uh, coin the American century if it won Asia. So uh, for him, the Asian century and the American century were in a sense combined. And he was very concerned during the Vietnam War um, that America was losing Asia. Secondly, I would say centuries are very short. 
Uh, and uh, again, the American century, no one talked about it before 1942, despite the fact that the United States had been the largest economy. Most people didn't know that, including Americans since 1869. So if there is a Chinese century, I don't think it will necessarily still persist at the end of the 21st century. Something else will come along. But the third, and this is my most glib remark, but I think it's also my most important, is we have to make sure the 21st century isn't the last century. Uh, and there are many reasons why it may be the last century. The astronomer Royal Martin Rees tells us there are seven scientific reasons why it may. But one is nuclear war. Uh, and, and Taiwan, it seems to me, is the most likely cause of World War Three, uh, And it's going to happen in the next seven, eight, nine, ten years. I think if we can get beyond that period, probably we'll find some kind of settlement for that uh, dispute. Um, but of course, if the Europeans had managed to get to 1916 or 17 without war, we wouldn't have had a First World War, but they couldn't make the last stage uh, of the run up to that struggle. So I do think that um, just to reiterate what I said, when historians look back, are they going to see these alliance systems uh, as a form of Cold War, to con not to contain China, because that's impossible, but at least to get China and its adversaries to think seriously about the next steps to their future? Or is it just going to be seen by historians as the first steps to a pre-war situation, a kind of 1920s and 30s in Europe? Uh, and that, I think, should really be the question we need to address. Great. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating. And thank you, everyone, for your time. I think it's very important first, by way of ending this event, that I should say that all of you panelists must know that we do these events, very interesting, very fascinating events. I do one every week. We can never do them unless all of you give freely of your time, your ideas, your intellect to make these conversations so dynamic. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm very, very grateful on behalf of the LSC South Asia Center. Um, a complete unedited version, a recording of this event will be available from tomorrow morning on our website for those who are watching and those who may have missed it. Um, and you're very welcome to go and go back and, and hear it in part or in full again. Uh, this event, this afternoon's event, ends our center's events for the Lent term. We'll be back on the 4th of May uh, with the next series of events, which if you follow us, you will find uh, all the details of. It only remains for me now to thank all our speakers, Frederick Greer, Yuka Koshino, Harsh Panth, Peter Watkins, and Christopher Coker. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Sure.